And they have a very nice face diagram still to look at. The camera is searching me, so I have to read. Should I read this? Sorry. No, no okay, excellent. <laughs> um, exactly, and they, they have a nice face diagram still uh, to com investigate completely. Uh, for people having bosons uh, in optical lattices, the question is, uh, do we have to switch off the machine, or is there something beyond this Bose-Hubbard model? And uh, well, there is a lot which has happened. The camera is uh, really crazy. I will stop moving for a second. Now, let's see. I'm not sure. It, it is working. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Just continue on the other Okay, good. I, I reset it already. I'm an experimentalist, so. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Maybe I have to wait a longer time. <laughs> That's the only thing I can do in the lab, uh, reset everything. I'm not sure. Maybe now I'm looking right in front. Anyway, it's work. Good. And um, well, this, this uh, third part, beyond Hubbard model, there has been a lot happening in the last uh, seven years now, eight, seven years. This has been a fantastic journey, and I would just do, would like to introduce you more, and then, well, let's say, I will not be in depth, otherwise I need three more lectures, uh, but to, to get you a feeling what we can do nowadays with this kind of optical lattices uh, in terms of uh, magnetic phenomena for neutral atoms, as well as topological properties and Measurement of transport in such, in such systems. Good. Um, so this third part uh, is strongly inspired uh, by another core uh, lecture at the Collège de France from Jean Dalivin. So please, next week, back home, drop everything and read a few lectures yeah, from the Collège de France. They're really excellent. And as I told you, it's in French, but it's not a problem from if you speak Spanish or Portuguese. Um, exactly, and I, I split it in three parts. <clears throat> the first one I will discuss um, what, why this magnetic phenomena um, in the lattice, why they're so important and why we want to look at them, uh, and how we do it is in the second block, uh, we have to play some tricks, because of course our atoms are neutral. So we have uh, what we call artificial magnetic fields. So I will explain in a second what it is. Uh, and the third block, I hope I can start, uh, in the, is how we can now have band structure which have topological properties. Has someone already heard of topological properties of band structure? Yes? A few, and all the others, that will be nice, because it's a very nice uh, concept to play with. Good. Uh, well, this magnetic phenomena in presence of, a, of an optical lattice, and this is basically the setting here. So this is, let's say now we speak, we really think of electrons on a solid in a 2D plane here. And we have a magnetic field here, this blue arrow. It's a constant magnetic field all over the lattice. Um, and then the question is, what happened? Of course, if you have a magnetic field and electrons, you know all that you get the cyclotron motions. Um, and therefore, you have a new length scale in the system. And you have the lattice spacing, which is set by the lattice. You know that you have this uh, band structure then uh, coming in, in momentum space now. And you have this magnetic lens coming in. So now it's a quantum mechanic description of the system. And the magnetic lens is basically uh, as a edge it's bar in, and it's scaling inverse with the magnetic field. So if you increase the magnetic field, you will get a smaller cyclotron orbit. Yeah? This is, this is also like this in uh, classical physics here. This uh, magnetic length is as a minimum length set by this uh, h-bar, so set by the Heisenberg principle. So on this uh, two-length scale, that's the usual thing when you have a problem with two-length scale, there will be a competition between the two, the interesting part is when they are comparable. It means that you have a magnetic lens which is comparing with your 
comparable with your lattice spacing. So your cyclotron orbit start to be of the size of your plaquette, more or less. <clears throat> so if, if we put numbers in there, it, it means that we have a, so we put square to get rid of the square root, yeah, simply. So this is a uh, unit less number. Uh, this ratio scales like uh, what we call the magnetic flux. That's simply the magnetic field time a square. That's the area of the plaquette. It's a, usual, it's a magnetic uh, flux through the plaquette um, over psi, psi naught, which is simply the quantum uh, of flux, h square over the charge of the electron. So if this becomes one, then uh, a lot of things happen. And one thing I will uh, introduce you in the first part is this kind of uh, uh, energy spectrum for electrons and such lattices with a magnetic field. That's how the band structure looks like. This is here for different alpha. Alpha is not yet defined, but it's the ratio of this uh, magnetic flux over the flux quantum. So this is basically varying or increasing your magnetic field. And this is the energy spectrum of your electrons. And you see there's a nice spe uh, spectrum. It looks like a fractal. It is one. Um, this is one effect which is really intri intriguing, but it comes in, you have to have uh, big alphas. So and for people working with solid state systems, uh, the latest spacing is one angstrom, and therefore they need really huge magnetic fields. Think of 10 to the 5 Tesla. So you, I don't know whether you have a feeling what is the maximum magnetic field achievable in labs. It's something like 30 Tesla. So in, I, I think in Russia they claim to have 80 Tesla, but the lab is, didn't survive. So it was for a short time. But well, routinely 30 Tesla, and then you really need a big machine. So 10 to the 5 Tesla is really, so they're basically probing this part of the spectrum. Uh, this part is really in, not easy to access. So one more thing that occur, so this is interesting to look at, and they can't go there. Uh, one more thing is, of course, in such a configuration, you get the quantum hole effect. This will be a big part of my third block today which is also interesting to look at. So one question, of course, is uh, this would be nice to look at with cold gases and optical lattices. Can we do it? If uh, the solid state physicists can't do it, uh, then we put a lot of effort. Uh, well, let's see. <clears throat> the problem, so the coupling between this electromagnetic fields and charged particle gives rise, is, is really central for many phenomena like the quantum wall effect, spin-orbit coupling, topological insulator. I will introduce all this concept later on. The problem is, while quantum simulation with quantum gases is also very nice because they are very, very well-controlled systems, as I showed, as I shown you to study this Hubbard model, so they, you can control tunneling interaction very well. Um, well, the problem is that the particles we are working with, they have no charge. They are neutrons. So if you switch a magnetic field and you have an electron, then you get the cyclotron orbit. Or, but if you don't have a charge, well, uh, there is no cyclotron orbit. So we can't simply switch a magnetic field. So therefore, we need to simulate these magnetic fields or magnetic effect, effects. Um, and this is a challenge. And this substitutes to real electromagnetic fields, electric magnetic field, uh, we call them artificial gauge potential. And this concept has been really uh, boosted by many, many uh, scientists in, uh, in our field. I mean, one of the first was, of course, Jean Dalibar, and together with now a lot of uh, theoretical input from uh, Maciek Levenstein, but, well, a lot of people jumped in, and a lot of concepts uh, came in to help us to overcome this challenge. Um, so for this, we really have to first step back. As usual, if you want to build a simulator, you have to really understand how the, the model is working. So let's step back um, and go back to our books, quantum mechanics. One first important thing is uh, 
what is called caged transformation. So you know it from classical physics. If you have a magnetic field, a charged particle, then you very well know the equation of motion of this problem. And you know that this uh, magnetic field is uh, the rotational of a so-called vector potential A. And this vector potential, you can uh, choose it among a certain class. So you, there is so-called gauge transformation where you transform this vector potential just by adding um, a scalar potential. And it describes exactly the same physics. So you have the same equation of motion. It because if you take the rotational, then this part drops. So now in quantum mechanics, um, the equation of motion is given by the Schrodinger equation. You know it very well. Yeah? In, in presence of a vector potential, you have this kind of a, a minimal coupling expression here where you have the momentum of your particle is impacted by this vector potential, which makes sense because magnetic and electric field, they couple to momentum. That's why you get acceleration or cyclotron orbit. Okay. Um, well, now, if I try to use my good old gauge transformation, so I, I replace here this vector potential by this one, which is this extra term, um, I guess you don't need to calculate to see that your wave function will no longer be a solution because it gets an extra term. It doesn't disappear here. <clears throat> because the description is directly with the vector potential and not with a magnetic field. So the case transformation in quantum mechanics has to be, you have to do something more. So you don't just modify your vector potential. You have to add, at the same time, a phase onto your wave function. OK? So your wave function is modified as well. So if, if a wave function uh, psi for a vector potential A satisfy this Schrodinger equation, then this psi prime and A prime will satisfy the same equation. But you, you have to change the vector potential and the wave function. It gets a phase. And this phase is really central because that's what we will, that's our handle. That's what we will use. Because manipulating the phase of a wave function, this we can do very well. Okay, so this is this phase. It, of course, it is a, it is this scalar potential in it. Um, it might sound strange, so can we see this phase? Is it something physical? And for that, I, mean, I will present what is called the Aronoff-Bohm effect. Who knows this Aronoff-Bohm eff effect? A few? Very good. So I will go through. Uh, the idea is depicted here. And this is a uh, Gedanken experiment. Uh, it, it's quite an old problem, almost the 60s. And what they, they were thinking is, OK, you, you have a two-pass interferometer for single electrons. So you have an electron emitter. You have some, some slits, actually. And you look on the screen. And you very well know if your electrons deprive wavelengths is large enough, you will see interference of single particle, right? And now they, they, they put an upgrade on this problem, and they say, OK, now we put in a solenoid, which is infinite. So if you think of a, that's a Gedanken experiment, it means you can think anything you like. So infinite. Then uh, if a current runs through a solenoid, you have a magnetic field inside, but outside it's zero. And the question was, uh, what happened to this interference pattern here if you switch a magnetic field? So who would expect that something happened? A few of you. Very good. The problem is, classically, so if you think in terms of classical physics, the electron, which are outside, they are coming outside the solenoid, so they don't see any field. So there is no Lorentz force acting on them or the trajectory. But uh, there is a shift of the interference pattern. I will explain why in a second. And in the New Scientist magazine, they, they even call it a seven, it's the seventh wonder of the quantum world. So by now, there are several experimental demonstrations. And it questions uh, the locality of electromagnetic fields. So you have two ways 
to look at the problem, uh, you have any way to become quantum at some point. So one way uh, is to say, OK, I believe in uh, fields, magnetic electric fields. But now I have to, ta to take into account that the particle are delocalized, and especially they go in the solenoid. Or you resign and say the particle, well, they, they, they don't tunnel in the solenoid. So they are localized around the solenoid. But then uh, the good description of electromagnetic fields are this vector potential. This is the one I like most, of course, because that's what we simulate. Uh, but both are correct and, and can explain the, the effect. Um, the effect is pretty simple to understand because it really comes from this gauge transformation. So now here it's a view, that's a solenoid, that's your, your screen where you see the interference pattern, right? Um, so to look at a certain point on the screen and, and try to find out whether a particle is there or not, what you do is basically you have to, to calculate such term where you have the wave function which goes to the left, uh, um, uh, um, conjugate times the wave function on the right. Yeah, and this gives you basically this is let's call zero where there is no current through the solenoid. This is the interference pattern you see, and now switching the current, this corresponds to a to a change of gauge. Yeah, because you have no current, so the, magnet, the vector potential is zero. But if you have now a certain current in there, you know very well that the magnetic field is zero outside. But this vector potential is non-zero. So you have to give it a finite value. Uh, and, and since there is no magnetic field, it is just this scalar part. Okay? And now, <clears throat> what you have if you calculate the interference pattern in presence of a current, you have this uh, phase factor on your wave function because it's simply a gauge transformation which comes in. And what you see here is because of the complex conjugate, you basically have a minus sign. So it's a, it's a different phase. So now if you go one times around this pass, or if you express for, no, sorry, if you express this uh, difference here, in terms of what it means, this, yeah, because it's a gradient, so the, the vector potential is a gradient of the scalar potential, you can re-express the scalar potential as pass integral, going from zero to air. Air is a point where I measure zero to air, and you see that because of the minus sign, what you will get is that it's a, it's a, it's a integral over a closed loop. So this is the phase that electrons gather if you switch this current in the solenoid because the, the, the vector potential is non-zero. And this phase is called the Aronoff-Bohm phase. And if you rewrite it, so you're very used to that classical electromagnetism, if you have a path integral of your vector potential, you can rewrite it as a, um, a, an area, so a flux of magnetic field. And you have to integrate your magnetic field of your, over the whole area. And this magnetic field is non-zero only in there. So you have the whole area. But you only take into account what is going through the solenoid, this magnetic flux. Okay? So they gather a phase, which is really the magnetic flux over this flux quantum that I have defined. Okay? So this is a, this is a quantity which, which is gauge invariant. This is a physical meaning. This we can measure. I mean, magnetic flux, one can measure. So these particles going around the solenoid, they see the magnetic flux without seeing the field, without sensing the field. And this is why this phase is really important. And that's a phase we will simulate. Okay. So it is gauge invariant. Uh, it's a geometric phase, and that's because it, there is no dependency on uh, velocity at which particle will go along this path. And it's even topological because you can deform the path. As long as you don't make a hole in there, you will get the same phase. Good. Well, so it means uh, in quantum mechanics, magnetic fields, electric fields, it's all about phases on the wave function. 
that a wave function will accumulate. So the description now, because we are working on a lattice, um, you have to take it. I hope the Aronoff Bohm uh, example convinced you. That's how a magnetic field is described. The presence of a magnetic field is described basically uh, on such a lattice. So what you get, it's called the Perl's substitution. So we didn't, it was already existing in solid state physics. Huh? That's not, we didn't uh, introduce it. So it's a long lasting concept. Um, it's not trivial at all to demonstrate it in a, in a good way. So I just want to give you a feeling. So it's, it means that in presence of a gauge potential A, you have complex tunneling elements. So here you see particles that hop from one side to the next. They gather a certain phase, theta, two, three, three, four, etc. Yeah? This is called the Perl's phase. And it's simply a path integral of your vector potential between two sides. Question? No. Good. Then if you think of a particle which goes a closed loop, so uh, ops all around the plaquette, the phase it will accumulate is simply the sum of all the theta. And again, you get uh, an integral of a closed path of your, of your vector potential, magnetic flux. So this phase is simply the magnetic flux over the flux quantum just to give you an intuition. So it makes sense. It's really, then you recover this concept of our North Bohm phase. Um, and that's how we do it in the lab. <coughs> so the way we do it actually, uh, or maybe it's, it's nice to step back and come back to band structure because it's all real space here. So what you see is particle when they hop, hop on a 1D lattice, the hopping is now directional. So if you hop to the right, you get plus theta. If you hop to the left, you get minus theta. Um, and, and this, if you put it in the, in the Bose Bart Hamilton operator, you will see that the dispersion relation that I've plotted here, energy, momentum, this is the first Brillouin zone of your uh, lattice. The, in black, it's uh, what happens without any gauge potential. We get the shift. It's just to give you an intuition, yeah, this minimum is shifting and this makes sense because all this kind of magnetic fields, they all act on the momentum. So I have to see something in momentum space as well. This is an important point because as you can imagine, since we are playing these tricks and we have no magnetic fields whatsoever in the system, it's not easy to measure the magnetic field. We cannot just put the a probe in the vacuum to see, it's just, it's an artificial magnetic field. So we have to find, we have to measure it very differently than in solid state physics, of course, with our ultra cold gases. Good, maybe one word um, on this nice spectrum you get. Um, so here you see, I've changed slightly the, this, this, uh, the definition of this phase you get. That's a usual, Thing. As soon as you have a magnetic field, you can make a certain choice of gauge. They are clever ones and less clever one. Here in the system, if you have a constant magnetic field, uh, it's nice to work in the so-called Landau gauge. And in that case, you simply acquire phases along uh, the, for horizontal tunneling and not for vertical tunneling. It's simply a convention, right? And now you can write what is called the upper Hamiltonian it's basically the Bose Hubbard Hamiltonian. So you hop from one side to the next. Here you have two indices, horizontal and vertical, because sometimes you have phases and sometimes not. Uh, I'll forget about the interaction for now, okay? This is what is called the Harper Hamiltonian. And what you can see on this Hamiltonian uh, are the symmetries. So if you now, in this Hamiltonian, change alpha to alpha plus one, the plus one gives you two pi times L, it's one. So it's invariant, okay? So it means you just have to work and study the spectrum from this alpha, which is basically the ratio, it's defined here, of your magnetic flux of, over this quantum flux between zero and one. So that's good. That reduces the problem already to a simpler one. And there, there is one thing one notice here. You cannot use the translational invariance along epsilon anymore. 
So you remember all this story with block functions, Bernier functions. I was always using the fact that we have a translation invariance. And there it's broken. So if you hop uh, to the next side here along the horizontal, you have a phase uh, which is non-zero. It's not the same than before. Um, so what you can easily see is if alpha is a, is a rational number, one third, then I just have to hop three times and then I have two pi and then I have one. So there you recover a, uh, you recover a translation invariance. But alpha, if alpha is non, is irrational, uh, it can take long before you come to two pi, right? So we, this problem is only solved for rational numbers because of this. So in case of rational numbers, it's super easy to understand where it comes from. Then you have to hop three times, as I said. If it's one third, you have basically a new unit cell, which is called the magnetic cell, and you have to hop three times in one direction instead of one. If you have now, um, an, uh, in such a system, so here it's depicted, you have now a new a magnetic cell, and it includes three sides. Well, uh, there you get bent, your bends, you can basically fold them again because you have a longer spatial, or you have a longer in space, a longer dim dimension, so it means they will split in momentum. So if you have three sides, you basically get three bands, sub-bands. This is the lowest band that we have calculated together. And because of this increasing in space, you get this folding in, in momentum space and splitting of the band. So instead of one band, you get three of them. Okay? And the origin of the fractal structure is simple to understand. If you have two numbers, rational numbers, which are very close to each other, like one third and 10 over 31. Well, basically the same for an experimentalist. They are very close to each other, but there, here, you just have to hop three times, and here you have to hop <laughs> 31 times to find your magnetic cell is very different. And that's why you get this kind of structure. If you zoom in, you will see that this are basically the splitting of these bands, and you have very yeah, very different number of sub-bands sub which are close together. So it is a very interesting system, of course. Um, so as I mentioned, the solid state physicists uh, can't make magnetic fields which go there, so they basically work in that regime here, uh, where you find the Landau levels, if someone knows about it, they are in there. Um, but they, they, they made a clever trick I don't have the reference of the paper. So I was saying the solid state system I've can't reach 10 to the 5 Tesla, but they realize that in, by twisting some graphene layer. And there, with this, you get some so called moiré patterns, or the, basically the spacing of your lattice is increased by orders of magnitude. So they, can, they could actually manage to map a bit of this uh, spectrum. So what about quantum gases? So how do we get there? Well, <clears throat> I've told you that the only thing we have to do is to manipulate the, the hopping in the lattice. Are there questions so far before I start to explain how we do it? No. Good. So that's the mo most funny part. Well, artificial gauge potential, artificial magnetic fields, it's all about complex hopping. As you remember, uh, the, the natural hopping in the lattice, well, it's a positive number because it's uh, simply the, the probability to hop to the next side. So we can very well control it. We can put it to zero pretty much, but we can't make it complex like this. So the idea is really to play to use the view in momentum space. So the, the fact that as soon as you have a, uh, a complex hopping here, your, band dis your dispersion relation gets shifted by a finite amount, then as an experimentalist, you, th you think, OK, how can I engineer my band structure so that the zero 
the minimum is no longer at sitting at quasi momentum zero, which is boring, because there, there is no phase that you gather, but at finite value. Well, this is possible. And this is what we call Fluke engineering. So it's a, it's a kind of a, it is, everybody call it like this now, so I use it as well. The idea is to use periodic driving. It's super simple. So the periodic driving is you take something of some parameter of your Hamilton operator and you modulate it periodically in time. Anything you can control. Let's say it could be interaction, could be tunneling, or you can what we did is really to move the lattice in space in a periodic manner. And, and this kind of periodicity, you know that it is very strong, so it, it's exactly the same than the Bloch theorem, eh, which, which gives you the Bloch bands, etc. Here, since uh, you have a periodicity in time, um, you, can you can say a lot about the system. You know exactly which form the eigenstates will have. This is exactly the same form than what you get for, for a Bloch state. Um, and you get, if you're in a lattice, eh, you're already have the periodicity in space, which gives you this first Brillouin zone. And now you have in quasi-energy, also a first Brillouin zone, and first, second, and et cetera. And you fold all your bands, get all folded together. So that's, that's a mess occurring here. So in real, if you really calculate, then it looks like spaghetti. So it's really close together. Uh, so I made it a bit pictorial here, but to give you the intuition now we can, the band are close together. This was the lowest band. This was a P band. Yeah, and this was, no, sorry, completely wrong. <laughs> of course, the lowest band is always the one with less curvature. And as you go up, you get more and more curvature. So in, in, uh, the, in green, it's the lowest band, and P band is minima at the edge. And then you have the third band, etc. And then you can start, you can start copying them because of this time periodicity, they will couple. And you get effective bands, and they can have, uh, uh, they can have characteristic of the second band or the third. You can really get anything. So that you mix them. So the <laughs> such kind of system are really extremely nice to study. There is a very powerful theorem, theorem like a mathematical theorem is always powerful, which tells that actually we know how to write, so the, this, this is the unitary time operator, so describing the dynamic in these driven systems. And then Floquet found, could demonstrate that uh, it can always be written like this, but he says only there exists an operator P, that's basically the one which brings you the micromotion out, and an effective time independent Hamiltonian describing the dynamic of your system. They exist, but uh, they, it doesn't explain how to calculate them. And they're not easy to get. Basically, you have to really to uh, work hard. So our theory collaborators work hard on trying to get this effective Hamiltonian. So then it's a, it's a very nice uh, uh, system because you see the physics is actually described by a time independent Hamiltonian. Which, which has new properties. Uh, but since it's super complicated to calculate it, as we started with this uh, business, we uh, stick to the limit where experimentalists can still understand something and calculate, like me, uh, this high frequency limit. So it means that you're driving it much faster than all other time scale of your system. And then the effective Hamiltonian is super easy to calculate. It's just the time average of your Hamiltonian over one period. This I can still handle. And there you see that uh, due to the driving, you get new properties. So eventually you get diamonds if you choose your parameters right. OK, there, with this kind of trick, we can manipulate the brand structure and engineer it so that it, it looks like one with a magnetic field. So <laughs> for the experimentalist, just a very short slide on how we did it. Uh, the first experiment, of course, we started with a one-dimensional lattice. And the trick we used is to accelerate the lattice in space. 
So the way to do it is very simple to implement. You just have to control, the, you control anyway the frequency of your laser. And now you detune one beam. So the whole interference pattern will get, start to move. And you make, a, like a, for instance, the cosinusoidal shaking. You always have to pay attention that you shake with a force with a mean value of zero. Otherwise, you just kick your atoms out of the lattice. Um, and then, if you do it fast in this, uh, so in this high frequency limit, as I, as I mentioned, you can f just explain everything with this easy, with these drawings. So the point is, uh, your atoms sitting, for instance, at at the quasi momentum zero, due to this force, yeah, it's a constant force, so the mo quasi momentum will get modified, uh, and you, they will scan this band structure over one period of time. And what you see easily here is that they will see higher energies. So if I make a time average view on which energy they have, because this is a very fast oscillation here, this point will move up. So you see here, this is the effective uh, band structure you can calculate after time averaging. That's the initial one. So this point will move up simply because atoms will see higher energies. Uh, on the contrary, if you're sitting at the edge of this brilliant zone, you see lower energy so that this point will move down. So you can invert the band structure simply by doing a co-sinusoidal uh, forcing like this. You get the minima here, and that's a nice point. You have a quasi-momentum pi over A, which means that while hopping, you get a phase of pi. Um, so this we were not the first to do, of course. Oh, I don't have the, oh, but I, uh, the, I should really add the, the reference to, uh, the theory was actually made, performed by Martin Oldhaus for this kind of systems. And the first realization in this context was for, by Ennio Arimondo in Pisa. Okay, so you can, with a, with a simple forcing, you can get this band structure inverted. And this is nice. What you see is uh, you can manipulate it. So if you, the quantity which is important is over which range you scan. So what is the forcing amplitude? So if you do it only a little bit, then you will uh, slightly modify your initial band structure. So we will start to squeeze a bit. If you go up to the edge here, you will have a flat band. And then if you go over the first brilliant zone, then you get this inversion here. And all this is really, you know, it's super easy to calculate. You know how this quasi momentum move over time, and you make this time average uh, elementary school calculation. Mm -hmm. So this, this is easy to measure how this effective tunneling is looking like. That's basically what we, how we measure that we renormalize the band structure. We simply make a time of line image. So this is one, one row is one time of flight image. You know, we have a 1D lattice, so we see this, we're working with bosons and they are superfluid. This is a time of line picture, giving you the um, reciprocal vector in your lattice. And what you see is if you increase along this axis now, the how much you scan the band structure, so your forcing amplitude, you see that abruptly you change from quasi-momentum zero to the edge of the first brilliant zone, and back and here. Okay, so you, we can pretty much measure what is occurring with the, with the band structure by looking at where is the condensate sitting. Just to give you an intuition here, we still have a, a decent coherence in the system. And for such a forcing parameters, like the lattice move, is moving over five sides. It's not a small perturbation. So th therefore, there is a lot of work still to do and uh, ongoing, a lot of people are contributing to understand how to prevent or reduce or control eating in such systems. But if you choose your parameter right, right uh, it, it works actually nicely. So here, time scales are like 100 to 100 milliseconds, 500 milliseconds in 1D. You can work with it. Good. So this is in 1D. Um, but it's not yet so super interesting if you make this easy forcing with a cosinus like Ennio Arimondo uh, in Pisa did it, you only get positive or negative tunneling. 
They call it negative tunneling because you gather a phase of pi, which makes a minus sign. So to, uh, in order to get a kind of shift, maybe I have it on the next slide, uh, you better not shake symmetrically to zero. So you just have to adapt the forcing. So the first thing we did is like uh, sinusoidal pulses, so a train, so you force and then you wait. You force the system and then you wait. And this means that your wave packet will uh, move up higher uh, on the, on the right-hand side than on the left-hand side. And if you now renormalize this, you get any kind of shifts. So you get any kind of pulse phase. And remember, this means I can simulate any kind of vector potential. <coughs> So in 1D, this is not super spectacular because so um, uh, it's a it's it's not a gauge invariant. In other words, you don't change the physics so much. You're just shifting your belt structure, but that's just a matter of definition. There is nothing happening to the band structure, and it's clear why because this uh, vector potential in one dimension. You, it's not yet a magnetic field for that. You need a second dimension. Because then you, uh, you can have a non-zero rotation. So this we did in a triangular lattice. So same trick. We have three beams. They interfere together. We get this kind of placket. And we really accelerate the whole lattice like on an, on an, in an elliptical orbit. And with this, uh, we can produce any kind of magnetic flux on a triangular placket, so we can control these phases here, these pulse phases, so that the particle really sees a magnetic flux. So the way um, it is in our in our case, um, because this is a unit cell of a triangular lattice for those who don't work with triangular lattice, and you get staggered magnetic fluxes. And this is not very complicated to understand. It's because the phase you get here is the same than here, because shaking is a global thing. So if you now go one times all around, uh, the phase you imprint here and the phase you imprint here, you undo here and here. So over this unit cell, uh, we have a magnetic flux of zero. But on these sub lattices, we have a magnetic flux, which can be large on the sub plaquettes. So one uh, question there was because they, that's not a typical model of solid state physics. It's quite hard for them to actually reverse a magnetic field uh, from plaquette to, a, to the next. So we were wondering, is it uh, interesting at all? Uh, and to, to know that, you just have to look at the band structure. Yeah, because all this artificial magnetic field will modify your band structure. And the nice thing is we can calculate it in one second, and that's what came out. Here is a um, band structure. Now in, a, in such a triangular lattice, you have the first Brillouin zone. It's a nice hexagon here. So you have six points. And the minimums, if you do nothing, the minimum, minimum of your band structure, the position where you condensate is living, is, is located at quasi momentum 0, 0. And that's a kind of picture you get, time of light picture. You see the threefold symmetry of the lattice now, directly from this drag peaks. And if you shake and make uh, fluxes of pi, so amplitude pi, these fluxes, they are for us only phases, right? So we define them from minus pi to plus pi, but it's still a stagger. You see here that the minima are now at the edge of this first Brillouin zone. And you have six of them. And there, the physics is completely different, of course. So you have six of them, but each of them belongs to three for Brillouin zone, so 6 over 3 makes 2 uh, degenerate minima. So you go into a situation where you have a Bose-Einstein condensate and 2 degenerate minima, where they can condense into. And of course, this is, a, this is a, a really interesting system. So here is how we look at it. That's a measure of the magnetic field. Basically, we can really say we have imprinted this, this magnetic flux because the minima are here at the edge and there the atoms sit there. Um, so we have done a lot of things with that, but I don't want to go too much into the detail, right? We have to go to the topology. Yeah? Why 
You mean here? Between the higher orders or between top and down? Ah, yes, that's a very good question. So this picture is actually a, not a single realization. This is an average over many realizations. So the, the funny thing was, we saw in the lab, we saw really like the condensate will choose one or the other minimum to condense into. So it was really alternating. This is because uh, of interaction. So that's not a superposition state uh, for, for a lot of things, a lot of reasons. So it's really like they were they choose, uh, I don't always choose one or the other. If you accumulate a lot of data, then you get 50-50, which demonstrate that you have no bias. But what is setting actually the contrast here is your Vani envelope. And here we're shaking into the text we have to switch off the lattice. Yeah, where time of flight means you abruptly switch off the lattice. And there is no point where there is no acceleration in this kind of trajectory. So the Vani envelope, if you would do it over one time period, will go all around uh, like this, and you will restore the symmetry. It's simply the jitter of when we switch off. Good. So that's how we measure magnetic fields in, in, in the system. And uh, of course, we're not the only one to do that. There were two groups, uh, uh, the excellent ones. They were working on that. They did it completely differently in the group of Wolfgang Ketterle and Emanuel Bloch. And I remember at the conference, Wolfgang Ketterle was saying, asking a question after my talk. I was young. I was nervous. And he was saying, it's really strange. We see similar effects, but we do it very differently. The idea was to induce tunneling with extra laser. And they had a huge magnetic field gradient, and we were just simply shaking the lattice. So it was, it was pretty right. This, the thing we do must be more or less exactly the same, but we couldn't, from the experimental point of view, make sense of, OK, you have two beams, two frequency, but we are shaking, so we have many frequency. How, how can it match? And this was um, Jean Dalibar, I guess, who brought the, the answer there. It's really. You can see everything in this concept of flow engineering. So they also have a time, periodic time modulation of the system. You simply have to see these beams instead of seeing them like beams which bring momentum and energy to go to the next side. These are running waves over the lattice. So they will do a kind of an amplitude modulation periodically in time. And then you are in the same flow frame. Flow engineering, you have the same time periodicity, same tools. So if you look at the old paper that we wrote at that time, uh, same year, uh, we were presenting the thing uh, completely differently, but we did, well, I didn't understand <laughs> that we were doing the same thing. Uh, it took some time. So they have, uh, however, a nice thing that we didn't have because of the symmetry of our lattice. They could rectify the magnetic fields after some time. So this is why they are this gradient of magnetic field. They have a rectified flux on each plaquette. It's always plum, pointing the same direction. And they could measure, with some tricks, the cyclotron orbit around the square plaquette. So it's really like a magnetic field. Your atoms, they're really like cycling around this plaquette. So this looks like broken. Uh, it is not. This is a theoretical description of what you expect. Uh, don't forget, it's a square plaquette. And then it's quantum mechanics. OK, so but it's really, we have cyclotron orbits. And what we see is, not, in our case, not uh, the, the cyclotron orbit in space, but we see a finite quasi-momentum. So it's, it's a basically equivalent. OK, so that's how we measure our magnetic fields and realize them. And then I can jump to my third part, because if you see that, then it's basically what we wanted to have at the start. A square magnetic, uh, a square plaquette with magnetic flux on it. And then you get the Harper model, and you expect to see the, the nice object of butterfly and some topological things. 
You have some question on this part. How? So, but with the flow engineering, you can pretty much do everything. You can really modify completely your band structure, get new properties into it. Very good question. It's uh, like a kilohertz or so. You have to be, however, careful in choosing this frequency. We took us a long time uh, to understand why. Um, but it's, it's a few kilohertz. More questions? So it's not difficult to implement. Good. Uh, well, then I jump to topology. So I guess you know a bit of topology, no? at least this picture coming from a, a website for the Nobel Prize. Um, I guess you know that topology and transport properties in materials are linked. Um, it's basically what is here. <laughs> this is a funny picture. Here, if you can't read at the back, it's written electric conductance and then some kind of zero, one, two holes. And this means that depending on the topology pro properties of your bands, which are categorized in Chern number, who knows about the Chern number? Okay, very good. And good that I have the complete lecture now here. <coughs> uh, you can get different the electrical conductance is quantized and exactly quantized and given by this chair number that I will explain in a second. Uh, and with this topological non-trivial band structure, you have really new properties. You have what they call, what is called anomalous velocity. So you kick something and it goes orthogonal to it. Uh, you have quantized conductance, which I've described here, uh, topological insulator and edge states. This concept I will, of course, define uh, in the lecture. So let's see. Uh, what is this topological properties and how uh, can we, for instance, calculate them? Um, so you remember this band structure and eigenstates. As soon as you are in a lattice, without doing anything now, at first, just a lattice, uh, you have eigenstates with a band index and a quasi-momentum k. You can calculate them with your favorite uh, basis, either block states, Banyan states, right? And then uh, there is a Barry introduced a very important concept, which is called the Barry connection, and that's I call it A, and that's for a good reason. It's, it has exactly the same properties than the vector potential A, and you can define a Berry connection, which is depending on the quasi-momentum k, band index n. What is this guy? This guy is a, is a scalar field. It's a product, scalar product of your wave function, band n, quasi-momentum k, and the gradient of your wave function. OK. Basically, what, what is here, if you think, uh, in small, like an experimentalist, or how I see it, is you have a, your wave function and you look how much is the wave function next to it in momentum space, how much are they different when I make a small displacement. That's basically what this gradient is doing, okay? You, you really compare the wave function and the one next to it. And this uh, Berry connection, uh, basically, you can introduce the Berry curvature, which looks like a magnetic field is written as a magnetic field here. Um, and it's really the rotational in K of this Berry connection. And this is um, this Berry curvature is like a moment, moment, magnetic field in momentum space. So now you have to think in K and no longer in space. But otherwise, they have extremely similar properties. And with this, because of this Berry connection of and Berry curvature, or well, the Berry connection is the one which lies behind, uh, you get what Berry called geometric phases that you accumulate if you now move in momentum space along a closed path. And the paper was really started with a remarkable and rather mysterious result of this paper, 
blah, blah, blah. You have to accumulate a certain phase if you have a finite Berry connection. It's the same mysterious phase and this Aronoff bohm phase, and that's something actually we can measure uh, in experiments, and it's a very important concept. Okay, it's, it's, uh, maybe I, I just go on. So this is the geometric phase that uh, Barry introduced. And if you go around a closed path and you see all derivation here, and they look like the same than in space with a magnetic field. If you integrate now in a closed space in K, you get some kind of a flux of your Barry curvature or inner surface in momentum space. And it has the same properties um, uh, in terms of uh, ge geometrical phase means it's not dependent on the velocity and it's also a topological phase because if you deform the path a bit, it doesn't change much. And the in central point, so you get the very phase if you integrate your Barry connection one time and now if you integrate a second time, basically you take this Barry curvature, you integrate it of the first Brillouin zone uh, and this integral will give you an integer, integer number. So this paper is, of course, a lot of mathematics in it, but that's, that's the power of it. So that you don't care which kind of solid you have or what is... The, as soon as you have the wave function and you can calculate them, uh, you can tell what is the turn number of the different bands. And quite often it's zero, but not always. And this uh, number is a gauge invariant uh, number. And that's why this chain number is used to categorize solids. Because it's, it's a nice quantity. You just integrate the Barry curvature over the first bryonson, and then you can tell whether you have a topological insulator and which kind of transport properties you will get. So I, I want to, I will have time, I see. Um, I will demonstrate here how the chain number directly gives you the quantum mole effect. Okay, that's a challenge. Let's see whether I make it. <coughs> so basically, simply from this one number, you know everything about your solid. Um, so let me maybe introduce all the concept in the next slide. This I will discuss later. So, why do chair number influence transport measurement? Let's start with something quite simple. Uh, we think of an atomic cloud, uh, here it's a boson, submitted to a constant force, or whatever, it's one particle first, along epsilon. So you have a cloud and you put a force along epsilon here. Okay? Now we want to see in which direction the cloud will move. Um, for this, you just have to calculate the average velocity of the eigenstate in which you are sitting in. Maybe there a band structure would help. So this I didn't really explain in details, but it's, you can find it in, a, in a very good reviews. So this is the lowest band. In a, in a lattice, 1D lattice, right? It's called K here. So now if you sit here, you have to uh, see what is the velocity of this point. And the velocity of this point is simply uh, the expectation value for the velocity operator, and it gives you the derivative of your band structure around the point where you are. So this has a zero velocity because the derivative is zero. Okay, if I would sit here, then I have a very large velocity. Okay, so the, the, from the point you are in the band structure, you get different velocity. For different eigenstates, different velocity. So now we have this velocity, and uh, we can describe the dynamic of this wave packet in a semi-classical way. So you know this equation. Right? Simply the derivative of the position is the velocity. So this is this guy. I have somehow uh, justified here. 
and uh, the, how your momentum is modified, quasi-momentum is given by this constant force. So this is simply to, very simple to solve, and what you get is the, what is called Bloch oscillation. Okay, so your quasi-momentum in time will simply increase linearly with time. You move here in quasi-momentum space, but you know that we are in a first, we are in a, we only consider a first Brion zone here, so it goes back here, so you have this oscillations in momentum space, and oscillation in space look like this. But it's only a movement along the force. Okay? Now, if we consider this concept of Barry curvature, well, then it will affect um, the velocity. So if you are in a 2D lattice, well, I didn't mention, but all this concept of currents, they go on first in a 2D lattice because you have to integrate over surface. Good. So now let's go into a 2D lattice and we have a finite, or whatever, we have a certain Barry curvature that we have to take into account. It's there, it's in your bands, you can't choose it, right? Uh, then the velocity, the mean value of velocity is an extra term. This is the one we discussed, which gives rise to the Bloch oscillation. And you have this extra term that's proportional to zero force, which goes along epsilon and the very curvature. And this gives you to what is called the anomalous velocity, and it will bring you a movement orthogonal to the force. It's a bit like a magnetic field in that sense, right? If you have a magnetic field, a particle coming with a certain velocity, you very well know that it will get deflected. Because you have this Barry curvature which acts like a magnetic field. As soon as you move, you get deflected. So there is a net drift transverse to the applied force. And this, um, this can be integrated over, uh, maybe, uh, okay, I did it like this. So because we want to come back to the chair number, so here you see it's something which is defined for each quasi-momentum. So basically now we ask the question, how is it if now I have a field band? So it's all field. You can do it with uh, fermions. Yeah. All your quasi, uh, all your eigenstates are occupied. Um, there is a certain of number of state. I mean, we don't care about the normalization here. It's not. We don't go so much in detail. But you can follow it afterwards. So we have a certain. We take the hypothesis that our feeling is uniform. So um, the density of state at a certain point k is simply a constant number. Not. You can do it with fermions. That's basically what happens. And then you, have, <clears throat> you can calculate this mean transverse velocity of the whole system, but then you have to sum over all k and all bands that are occupied, because they all contribute, but in a different manner, due to this local Barry curvature. So if you make this summation, you get the sum of the turn number. It means that the velocity you get, if you apply a force, Orthogonal to this force is simply given by this Chern number. Or more precisely, the sum of all the Chern number of bands that are occupied. And this is the explanation of uh, why the quantum wave effect is working. That's my next slide. I never understood the quantum wave effect before <laughs> teaching this lecture in Hamburg. I had to dive into it. But it's actually very simple. I don't know why in solid state physics it's not, in books it's not so simple to get, I find. I don't know. Who didn't understand the quantum wall effect yet? Uh, like me a few years ago, okay. Let's see. The other maybe think they understood and now they will discover. Um, so where is the quantum wall effect? Before going to the quantum, let's go back to what we all know, the whole effect. The geometry is like, uh, Given like this, you have a certain material, and then you're trying to run a current through it. <coughs> uh, and then, if you have a magnetic field, that's an important point, it should be bigger on this figure. It comes from Wikipedia, I should write, or not from this book here. Um, 
In presence of a magnetic field, your electrons here, they will get deviated by the Lorentz force. There is a magnetic field, they have a velocity, so deviation, right? Orthogonal to it. And then you expect to measure a uh, whole voltage which is non-zero, simply because you have charge accumulating at one side. Classical physics. So these people were expecting, and what was the expectation of the quantum wall effect? Well, uh, that was the idea when they started the measurement. So this quantum wall effect, um, it was to demonstrate that for a very large magnetic field, you get the microscopic occupation of the Landau levels. So that if you have basically the regime where you have this, your cyclotron orbit is as large as one plaquette of your sample, in that regime, you can put a lot of electrons in a single Landau level. Okay? So this, this quantity, maybe it's not so super important. There's a filling factor, it just counts how many electrons per flux of a magnetic field. The important graph is here. So if you increase your magnetic field in such a system with a certain fixed chemical potential, right, uh, you will, uh, may, maybe we are missing the fact that this uh, lambda level, they scale, the spacing scales with the magnetic field. Believe me. So higher magnetic field, so these levels get so like an harmonic oscillator at the end of the story. Um, we can think of it as a set of equally spaced levels, right? This sort of this, uh, Landau levels. And there's, their spacing is um, proportional to the magnetic field. Or square, or I don't remember. This I should check. But if you increase the magnetic field, the spacing increase, and if you have... Uh, if your chemical potential don't move, then uh, you have to, all your atoms have to uh, sit in the same level. So the, the effect they, will, they were willing to measure is the following. So now imagine you can change your chemical potential, and they were expecting to see that the material goes from, here it's an insulator, because your uh, chemical potential is between two levels, to um, uh, some, something like a method, okay? The setup they had, it's coming from this uh, book, sorry, I teach in Germany, so it's in German here, looks like this, it's more or less like the classical one, right? You have the sample, uh, you run a current through it, you have the, here are two dimensional electron gas, and you have this gate electrodes. And they run the current and measure Basically, they, will, they were willing to measure uh, this whole voltage along epsilon, but since they were very good experimentalists, they measured as well uh, the current along x. Oh, sorry, is, oh, is the geometry here? No, they were, they were measuring, uh, the, they were willing to measure along x, I'll explain why in a second. Now I see the curve. So these are the, the result of this measurement. They were varying this uh, gate potential. With this gate potential, you can basically vary the chemical potential of your electron gas, okay? And they were willing to see that this uh, 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 is it voltage here, it's all in German, so I have to speak in German. This voltage here is uh, vanishes periodically. And that's what they measured here. So it vanishes here, and then you get a zero here, another zero, you get a bit of dirt in between. But that's what they were expecting. As soon as your chemical potential is between two Landau levels, you get something which is insulating. Yeah, insulating means the voltage is zero, and the current is not running. That was the expectation. And then they measured also this whole conductance, the one of the classical uh, physics, and they saw but there was some plateau here, and this was not expected. And this is what is called, what, why they got the Nobel Prize. That's because this other uh, voltage, this whole voltage is as plateau. And this plateau, they come from the fact that 
you have non-trivial topological bands in your system. And if you remember what I told you, here we have a two-dimensional electron gas, we have a field band, right? And we move this Fermi level between the bands. And if, if you remember the expression I wrote right before, we expect that the transverse velocity is given by the sum of the chain number of the occupied band. And each time you move your Fermi level, you get well, uh, one more chain number or one more band contributing to it, and you get one plateau in there. Okay? This is really directly linked to this anomalous velocity, which is a measure of the chain number. So, and this finishes the story of this quantum mole effect. The transport measurement always reveal the chain numbers. Okay? When you run a current through a sample, Measure of voltages, all this gives you access, direct access to the chair number. Are the question at this stage? Did you re understand the quantum wall effect? Or is it worse or better now? <laughs> Good, I hope better. So, the, um, these chair numbers, this is what we want to measure as well. If we want to do it with cold atoms, we would like to measure chair numbers. And we have topological. So here, it's just to close the loop with this kind of uh, picture that for different chair numbers, which means that you have very different topological properties, the same difference that between a blob, a cup, and a, and a pretzel here, uh, you get more and more conductivity. So we have different uh, systems which have topological bands, and they are realized in the lab. I finished my second, my this second block today uh, showing you that the realization of the Harper model is already implemented in the lab. So they have topological band structure, of course, because if you have, this is the setting of the quantum mole effect. So here, there you expect to have non-zero churn number. Um, so this is a nice thing. Then another one we have I wanted to mention because uh, it has been realized first by Tilman Esslinger, but we do, are also working with it in Hamburg. Uh, this is the so-called Halden model. Halden uh, had a very nice idea how to get topological bands without the constant magnetic field. So he started from a, a gra graphene uh, hexagonal lattice, and now this is what we have in the lab. Uh, now you can pretty easily um, calculate, I can do it, so it's really easy. The Barry curvature of your band, and it's non-zero. Because in the case of graphene, maybe you remember, there the band structure has this direct points, touching points in the, in the energy bands, and they come from the fact that you have two sides per cell. Because to construct such an hexagonal uh, uh, lattice, you need to, uh, two triangular lattices with A and B sides. It's a so-called bipartite lattice. And then you get this folding on top, and you have two touching points between the bands. And that's where this very curvature is accumulating. But now you see from this picture, this is the first brillouin zone. If I integrate all over, then I get zero. Because so there are positive part and negative part. So the chain number is zero. If you do a bit more, and there was a nice idea by Aldane, if you now break time reversal symmetry, and that, what he did, it was, it was a, a theory, right, right, a long time ago, is to bring here this kind of uh, coupling with complex phases. Uh, complex next neighbor tunneling between us, A and our B sides. This leaves the degeneracy at the red direct points, and you get very nice Barry curvature, which you can calculate as well. So now you see that if I integrate here, I eventually get non-zero, or it's at least much larger. So with the circular acceleration of the, of the lattice, as I mentioned to you, you break as well time reversal symmetry, and therefore you get this in the bands. So there are two uh, realizations now, there are more, but uh, I don't want to make a long list, 
just to give you a feeling of band structure with topological properties. The big question is how do we measure that? Because usually uh, in, in solid state physics, they have a probe, well, a sample, they put the current, measure some voltages. So with quantum gases in a vacuum chamber, that's not so easy to implement. So we have to, again, uh, step back, but then there was a fantastic amount of, of um, uh, work from theory as, uh, who suggested how we could look at this kind of properties. And basically, just to make a short summary, because time is passing, uh, that's a three quantity we can ac access directly. So we can measure the Chan number. We can as well do some kind of a transport measurement, uh, either by kicking the cloud and to looking at in which direction it goes. That's possible with coal atoms. So this kind of measurement we can do. Um, quantized connectance is measured like this. Um, the only thing, another thing we can do is to count the edge state. So I didn't mention that, but there is a theorem. It's a long paper. I think no, well, I never read it. But it's only valid for non-interacting particles, and it's already super complicated to understand, but it links the chain number is the number of edge states. So it tells you if you have a chain number of one, then you expect to have one sta edge state at the edge of the, your sample. It's a, it's a chiral edge state. So if you can resolve these edge states, and that's uh, something very, very challenging in solid state physics, there are only very few groups of small indication because there are very small currents at the edge of the sample, um, and you have to have nice edges, which is not so easy. Uh, therefore, it's for them very difficult to see the edge states. But in, in, our, in some kind of a, uh, very clever configuration, it has been presented yesterday, I'm so sorry that I missed it. I thought all my paper were tomorrow. But then everything has been explained already, no? You know this picture. Um, you can work with a one-dimensional lattice and then use the internal degrees of freedom of the atom to build the second dimension. And the idea was it is that you have sharp edges, at least in the so-called synthetic dimension. Because you have only three internal states, no more. And there you expect to see nicely these edge states. Um, and this was uh, an example of a paper came, uh, or an idea came in the group of Maciek Levenstein, and then it has been implemented by two experimental groups within two years, and then demonstrated. So it can go, it can go quite fast as well. So counting the edge states is like basically telling how big was the churn number. Now, uh, since we have very nice coherent cloud, especially if you have bosons, you can really move them in the band structure now. And, and like the concept of a Berry phase, you can move your cloud and look at which phase you accumulate and therefore measure directly the Berry phase around the direct point, for instance. This has been done in a group of Emmanuel Bloch. And mapping the Berry curvature is also possible. So I remind you, if you know the Berry curvature, then you integrate one time along a path, you have the Berry phase, and you integrate another one time, well, all over the band structure, you get the Chern number. So if you have the Berry curvature, you basically can reconstruct everything. And this is something uh, which is impossible to access in solid state system. And it's possible to map it. So it's basically a map uh, in the hexagonal lattice. This is in our group, uh, work by Christoph Weidenberg, where they really get pixel by pixel in the, in the Brillouin zone, how the very curvature is looking like. So this is, in that sense, uh, very complementary to what our colleagues are doing in, in, in solid state physics. We have access to very different complementary quantities. <clears throat> Good, well, now, it's, it's actually time to get finished. So I will skip this. Uh, just a short summary where we are with this artificial gauge field. So I've shown you that uh, one can realize electromagnetic fields, right? Um, magnetic field on the lattice using flow gauge engineering 
forget about this. That's a different method that has been used by Jan Spielmann. It's uh, valid as well. So he was using the idea with two laser beams. And he even made spin orbit coupling out of it. Uh, so you can really get quite a lot of new effects in the lattice by shaking or putting more lasers. Um, all that we have some topological band structure, Harper model, I, uh, Halden model, today they are more, more than that. Uh, and then we can measure, especially how to measure this topological properties using quantum gases. And there's a lot of challenges and therefore and it's good that young motivated people <laughs> want to continue in this direction, there's a lot of open question. What happened with interactions? So far it was all non-interacting because there we still understand, but there was a lot of open question because now we can switch on the interaction or using a flash bar resonance, but there, 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 there is no theory so far. Good. Um, and with this, I, go, I conclude the whole lecture and it was a pleasure be here, and I hope you enjoyed it a bit as well. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Was it so unclear? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a very difficult one. It's a complicated procedure. Um, we need another lecture. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, they were, how is it called? It's not tomography. They were using dynamic, dynamical evolution of the wave packet to retrieve this barrier curvature. So they had fermions, so that the bands are completely filled and you can really measure each and every point. And while well, they sit with a certain finite barrier curvature, so that they, that will influence our time involving in dynamics. Oh, it's, a, it's not so simple, but it, I mean it's not so simple in terms of concept. But the measurement uh, is not so long, and the analysis data analysis needed. More questions? Okay. Maybe it's time for a break, right? <laughs> okay, thank you again.